Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ashish Sahib, as our speaker today. Uh, so Ashish uh, has a very uh, career. Uh, he got his undergraduate degree in W and his master's in biomedical engineering. Uh, then he worked in industry for a while. So he worked for this company called uh, NeuroFocus, uh, which was then acquired by Nielsen, which is a famous ad ratings and data measurement firm. So at NeuroFocus, uh, he worked on the effectiveness of advertising using EEG signal analysis. So this is like uh, neuromarketing for, for the brain. Uh, and I, I think uh, Eric Candle was on the board of NeuroFocus for, for a while. Right. Yeah. Uh, so then he got senior research fellowship and went to work for DRDO. Uh, so DRDO is a, Indian, uh, it's a premier Indian defense research organization. And at DRDO, he was studying uh, cognitive states of these soldiers under extreme physical conditions using EEG and fMRI. Uh, so so all, all of these experiences uh, piqued his interest in, in the brain, the workings of the brain. So he got his PhD in neuroscience uh, from the Max Planck Institute uh, at Tübingen. Uh, so now he's here at UCLA uh, working as a postdoctoral fellow in Captain Nas lab and he works on uh, uh, modeling the functional connectivity of ketamine response in uh, treatment resistant depression, which is the topic of this talk today. So let's welcome Arthur. Thank you, Shantanu. Uh, so, depression is one of the world's leading cause of disability, and more than 17 million people have had at least one depressive episode. And the symptoms of this disorder span over multiple domains of emotion, thoughts, physical ability, and behavior. Moreover, standard treatments take several weeks or months to be effective. And approximately 50% of these patients who undergo treatment may relapse within six months and around 30% can be treatment resistant. So there is an urgent need for improved and faster acting interventions. Rapid interventions such as electroconvulsive therapy, sub anesthetic doses of ketamine and total sleep deprivation can alleviate symptoms within hours and patients can achieve remission within days. I just want to make a point here about total sleep deprivation. Although it alleviates symptoms, it's only temporary. And it's only used in the context to understand the mechanisms of fast acting interventions. To understand the mechanisms of these interventions using imaging, here at UCLA, we are part of the NIH sponsored Connectomes Related to Human Disease Project in treatment resistant depression. Just like the Lifespan project, this is an independent project linked to the larger Human Connect Home project. Most of you may already know that the Human Connect Home project was initially started between the University of Minnesota, Oxford, and Washington, where they came together and developed cutting edge image acquisition techniques and analysis protocols. These protocols were further refined and are used in the current project to identify structural and functional biomarkers across various fast-acting interventions. Today I will specifically focus on ketamine but why do we want to understand the fast-acting antidepressant effects of ketamine? To know this Let's go back all the way to 2000 where John Crystal and group showed that a single dose of ketamine produced predominant clinical response and this was seen within hours after the first dose. Most of these patients achieved remission and they remained in this state for days to weeks. An important thing to know about ketamine and often misunderstood is that 
this clinical response is not due to the behavioral effects. The behavioral effects of ketamine are completely gone after two hours. But what we see in terms of the clinical response is the brain body reaction to this drug. So when patients respond or give the maximum clinical response, they are not intoxicated, they are not high, and there are no side effects of the drug. Instead, the response is due to the reaction to this drug a day before or several days before. Here is a study from Duman and group that might explain the mechanism of ketamine. Here on the left, we have a dendritic input to a nerve cell. And the red arrows indicate the spines, which are important for synaptic connectivity. In the middle, we have a dendritic input of an animal which has undergone conic stress. And we see that these spines are significantly reduced. And on the right, we have a dendritic input after ketamine treatment, particularly 24 hours after ketamine treatment. And we see that the spines are significantly increased. They are almost same as the baseline. So this suggests that ketamine stimulates rapid regrowth of synaptic connectivity which is essential for cognition and brain function. However, how these translate to large scale networks in the human brain is still poorly understood. So today I will talk about how sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine modulate the functional connectome in patients with major depression. When a participant is placed in an MRI, we can study the brain activity using functional magnetic resonance imaging, also known as fMRI. And in this case, we can study spontaneous activity at rest. In some cases, the participant may be instructed to see a crosshair so that they don't fall asleep. And here is a representative example of a single subject. But these spontaneous fluctuations are consistent across subjects. And they can be mapped in the form of various functional networks, such as the default mode, the frontoparietal, the salience, and the visual. We can also study the brain activity using task fMRI or see how the brain responds to a particular task. For example, in this case we have a working memory task and we see the activity in the frontoparietal network. Here on the right, we have large scale functional networks at rest that are known to be implicated in patients with major depression. And on the left, we have several nodes that are also implicated in MDD with respect to task fMRI. There is a limited amount of neuroimaging literature with respect to ketamine treatment. Here is a study from James Murrow group that showed the bold activity in the right chordate increases for positively valence stimuli after a single infusion of ketamine. The chordate is an important part of the striatum and is known to be involved in emotional processing and reinforced learning. And their results suggest that ketamine alleviates the depressive symptoms by reversing the disruption in the glutamate signaling in this prefrontal striatal pathway. Another study also showed increases in bold activity during an emotional task paradigm in the anterior cingulate. They also showed increases in bold activity in the occipital cortex. The occipital cortex is known to be disrupted in patients with major depression. And other antidepressant treatments such as SSRIs and SSNRIs have also modulated 
bowel activity or fMRI activity in the occipital cortex. And these results again suggest the treatment effects of ketamine. In terms of resting state fMRI, one group showed an increased global brain connectivity in the DLPFC, insula and the caudate, while another group followed a seed-based approach and showed that the functional connectivity between the DMN and the salience network, particularly the insula, increases after the first infusion of ketamine. And this increase in connectivity was associated with clinical outcome. The insula is an important part of the salience network and the salience network is known to be disrupted in patients with major depression. The salience network is also involved in switching between the default mode network and the frontoparietal task positive network. And these findings suggest that ketamine normalizes the dysfunction of the salience network. But if you look closely, there is still a substantial amount of missing information with respect to ketamine. We still don't know whether ketamine modulates other large scale networks in the brain, such as the frontoparietal during a cognitive control task or deeper substructures such as the amygdala and the hippocampus are modulated with ketamine treatment. Further, we still don't know whether ketamine modulates functional connectivity within and across other large scale networks. This may be due to the limitations associated with the current literature. Most of these studies are limited by a small sample size. They have looked at only 18 to 25 patients and they have only looked at single infusion of ketamine. As a result, there are a lack of viable biomarkers. Using our design, we hope to overcome some of these limitations of the current literature. We use the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale for clinical assessment in our study. Patients who fail two or more standard antidepressants and who have a HDR score of 17 or greater are included in the study. They undergo a baseline MRI scan and one or two weeks after the baseline MRI scan, they receive 0.5 milligrams IV infusion of ketamine for 40 minutes. And 24 hours after this infusion, we have the second MRI scan along with the clinical assessment. These patients come back after two or three weeks and they receive three infusions over a week. And after the final infusion, 24 hours later, we again have the third MRI scan along with the clinical assessment. At the end of treatment, patients who have a HDR score of seven or less are known as remitters, while who have an improvement in HDRs of 50% or greater are known as responders. And in the current study, we had around 50% remitters, while 60% were responders. Using this design, we could study the acute effects as well as the serial effects of ketamine treatment in patients with major depression. We wanted to answer three main questions. How does single ketamine infusion modulate the functional connectome? How does repeated ketamine therapy modulate the functional connectome? And identify biomarkers of ketamine response related to this connectome. We will use various MRI methodologies to answer these questions. We will use ASL imaging to estimate the cerebral blood flow in the brain at rest. We'll see how ketamine modulates the emotional circuits in the brain during a face matching emotional task. Then we'll see how ketamine modulates the cognitive control network during a response inhibitory task, also known as the carrot task. And lastly, we'll see how ketamine modulates large scale functional networks in the brain at rest. First, I will start with how ketamine modulates the cerebral blood flow in patients with major depression. The CBF is estimated 
using a simple technique of ASL known as arterial spin labeling. In this technique, we magnetically label the blood across a plane and then wait for this labeled blood to reach the cortex. At this point, we acquire the MRI image. We also acquire an image without the labeling. And the subtraction of these two images gives us the perfusion weighted image. This is a quantifiable measure of CBF in the brain. And it is extensively used in the context of various neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. It is also used to study the effects of various treatments in patients with major depression. Here on the right, we have increased CBF with electroconvulsive treatment in the hippocampus, thalamus, and dorsal striatum. While on the left, we have a pharmacotherapy treatment of venlafaxine, which has decreased the CBF in cingulate and somatomotor regions. However, there are no CBF studies at the moment that have looked at ketamine treatment in patients with major depression. And most of these previous studies lack the spatial and temporal resolution. They usually have had a spatial resolution of 3.5 or 4 millimeter isotropic and they take around 10 to 15 minutes to estimate the CBF map. With the help of the new multi-band ASL sequence developed by the Human Connectome Project, we can achieve CBF maps with high spatial resolution under five minutes. The main analysis of this project was to identify CBF changes after single infusion, see how serial infusion modulates CBF changes, and whether early changes in perfusion could predict end of treatment outcome. First, we will see how ketamine modulates CBF changes after the first infusion. After the first infusion, we see a significant increase in cerebral blood flow in the posterior DMN and primary and secondary visual areas. If you look at the average CBF in one of the representative ROIs, such as the left cuneus here, we see that patients at baseline, that is TP1, have much lower CBF as compared to healthy controls, although not significant. <coughs> At time point two, that is after the first infusion, we see a significant increase in CBF, which shows a trend towards normalization. Next, we will see how serial ketamine infusion modulates CBF changes. After the fourth infusion, we saw modulatory changes in the bilateral hippocampus and the anterior insula. And if you look at the average CBF in these particular ROIs, we see that at time point one, patients show much higher CBF as compared to healthy controls. And after serial treatment, this is normalized. So these results suggest that repeated exposure of ketamine is needed to perturb the deeper subcortical structures, while the first infusion modulates more of the cortex, that is the primary and secondary visual areas. And next, we wanted to see whether early changes could predict end of treatment outcome. For this, we parcelated the CBF activation using a free surfer atlas, and we saw that early changes in the left cuneus could predict end of treatment outcome. These results suggest that the engagement of primary and secondary visual areas that may be due to the dissociative phenomena of ketamine are associated with antidepressant response. So going back to the model, we see that the first infusion of ketamine increases the cerebral blood flow in the posterior cingulate and the occipital cortex while repeated exposure of ketamine is needed to perturb the deeper subcortical circuits such as the hippocampus and anterior insula. And early changes in CBF can predict end of treatment outcome. Moving on to see how ketamine modulates 
the emotional circuits in the brain, we used a simple face matching task. Faces are an important component of daily visual communication. And patients with MDD are known to show a bias in terms of processing these faces. That in turn has an effect on the interpersonal and social problems. Whenever a emotionally balanced stimuli is presented, there is an interaction between the cognitive control network of the brain and the autonomic limbic system. Patients with MDD are known to show a hyperactivity in the limbic system for negatively balanced stimuli, while they show a hypoactivation for positively balanced or happy faces. In a current study, we use a simple face matching task where patients have to, subjects have to match the faces at the bottom with the images on top. There are four conditions of happy, fearful, neutral and objects. And we have two runs of seven minutes. Using this face matching task, we wanted to see whether bold changes to happy and fearful faces are modulated after serial ketamine infusion and whether these changes are associated with clinical outcome. First we will see whether bold changes to happy and fearful faces are modulated with ketamine or not. We see that after the fourth infusion, ketamine modulates the bold activity in the bilateral amygdala, predominantly the right amygdala. And if you look at the average activity, we see that this is significantly reduced over time. <coughs> Moving on to see the associations with clinical outcome, we saw that at the whole brain level, the bold changes in the superior temporal cortex showed associations with clinical outcome. The superior temporal cortex is a multimodal associative network involved in body and facial processing, and it has connections to the deeper limbic structure such as the amygdala and insula. So these results suggest that changes in the superior temporal cortex could underlie symptom improvement and restore emotion processing. So going back to the model to summarize the bold activity during an emotional paradigm, we see that there is a decrease in bold activity in the amygdala and changes in the superior temporal cortex are associated with treatment outcome. Next we will see how ketamine modulates the cognitive control networks in the brain during a simple response inhibitory task, also known as the carrot task. Response inhibition in simple terms can be defined as the suppression of actions that are inappropriate in a given behavioral context. And deficits in this response are observed in various neuropsychiatric disorders, including MDD, where patients find it difficult in inhibiting an impulsive behavior. The no-go task or the carrot task has been extensively used in the context of neurofunctional imaging to study response inhibitory processes in healthy as well as diseased populations. Various fMRI studies have tried to identify the neural correlates of response inhibition. And looking at the no-go versus go contrast, they consistently reveal the right frontoparietal network. Some parts of the cerebellum are also implicated. And here is the preliminary findings from the HCP development group that showed that in addition to the frontoparietal and insula, there's also activity in the striatal networks. We use the same task as the one used in the HCP aging and development protocol, where subjects had to respond in the form of a button press to certain geometrical shapes and inhibit this motor response to circles and squares. And the average activation for the no-go versus go contrast is seen here for healthy controls. And just like in the literature, we see this right frontoparietal activation and a decrease in activity in the left motor cortex. Compared to healthy controls, 
patients showed a much higher bold activity and if we look at the average activation of the entire cohort with larger samples we could then elucidate bold activations in the cerebellum as well as the striatum. Using this response inhibition task we wanted to identify bold changes during response inhibitory network after serial ketamine infusion and see whether early bold changes could predict end of treatment outcome. First we will see how bold changes are modulated during this no-go versus go contrast after serial ketamine infusion. After the fourth infusion we saw a significant decrease in bold activity in the right frontoparietal network. We also observed activity in the primary and secondary visual areas. And if you look at the average activation in one of the representative ROIs such as the rostral middle frontal, we see that patients at baseline had a much higher activity, although not significant, which decreased with ketamine treatment. Generally, patients with MDD show decreased activity as compared to controls. But recent work by Scott Langanker has shown that patients who might have anxiety disorders show a much higher activity during response inhibition. So although we are looking at treatment resistant depressed group, within this group we have multiple subgroups. So this increased activity may be associated with anxiety also. Next, we wanted to see whether early changes in bold could predict clinical outcome. And we saw that changes in the primary and secondary visual areas, just like the CBF results, could predict end of treatment outcome. Here again, if you see the highest clinical response is associated with a minimal bold change. So the patients who show the highest change in bold activity are not particularly responding. So this shows more like a treatment resistant effect, but nonetheless it's an important biomarker. So to summarize the findings from the carrot task, we see a decrease in bold activity in the right frontoparietal network and the visual cortices. And early changes, in bold changes, in the visual cortex are associated with end of treatment outcome. Finally, moving on to see how ketamine modulates large scale functional networks at rest. Patients with major depression are known to show disrupted functional connectivity within and across large scale networks. Here is a recent study from Chao Gan group that showed there is a decreased connectivity or disrupted connectivity within the DMN. There's also disrupted connectivity within the visual cortex and the somatomotor regions. So this shows that there is an intrinsic disruption in the visual and somatomotor network and we see various treatments modulates this network. They also say that in order to precisely localize the functional activation when using a priori atlases, large data sets are required as they had 1300 MDT patients that were compared with 900 controls. So there is a need for data driven approaches for more targeted analysis. One way by which a data-driven approach can be implemented is to concatenate the entire fMRI time series across the population and split this data into various spatial components using independent component analysis. Each of these spatial components are represented by a single time course. And these can be used as nodes and the relationship can be computed between them in the form of edges. And this network can be represented in the form of a square matrix where each entry in the matrix is a relationship between a pair of nodes.
In the current study, after pre-processing, we performed a high-dimensional group ICA of 200 components. And each of these components were mapped back onto individual subject space. Out of the 200 components, we could identify 172 good or clean resting state components. Some of the components are shown here. In addition to the default mode network and other sensory networks such as the visual, we could also achieve functional parcellation of deeper subcortical structures such as the hippocampus, amygdala, and the cerebellum. So this is very exciting because this is for the first time that we are showing that in a clinical setting, we can achieve functional seg segmentation of so many large networks. This was previously possible in data sets that had long fMRI scans of around 15 to 30 minutes. But just under 15 minutes across the population, we can have a data-driven segmentation. So using this, we can identify nodes and we don't need to use any a priori ROIs or atlases. Once these nodes are defined, we can compute a pairwise relationship and arrange this in the form of a matrix. And this matrix can be used to perform resting state analysis. In the current study, we first looked at cross-sectional effects between patients at baseline and healthy control. Then we saw how serial ketamine infusion modulates this large-scale functional connectivity. And then we wanted to identify resting state connectivity biomarkers in terms of remission. First, we will see what's the difference between large-scale functional connectivity between patients and controls at baseline. As shown by the Shaogan group, we saw that there was a decreased connectivity between the somatomotor network. In the current project, we also see that patients at MDD, that is at time point one, show reduced connectivity within the somatomotor network. And over time, or at the end of treatment, although not significant, it shows a trend towards normalization. Still at the cross-sectional level, we know that patients with MDD are known to have disrupted functional connectivity within the visual and language association regions. And in this study, we show that across these networks, there is also a disruption. For example, compared to the controls in orange, we see much higher connectivity for patients, which again shows a trend towards normalization with ketamine. Moving on to see how ketamine specifically modulates the functional networks at rest, we saw that connectivity between the motor part of the cerebellum and the dorsal salience was positively correlated at baseline. And they showed much higher connectivity with respect to controls. And this connectivity significantly reduced with ketamine. This particular circuit of the cerebellum and the dorsal salience is known to be involved with emotional processing. And we again see that ketamine specifically modulates the salience network. Next, we wanted to identify large scale functional connectivity in terms of remission. And we again see the cerebellum and the connectivity with the striatum, including the insula, to be much higher at baseline who remit. So this network again is part of the salience network. And we see that ketamine significantly normalizes the connectivity in remitters, while for non-remitters, it has an opposing effect. And we also saw that the baseline connectivity in this network could predict end of treatment outcome. So to summarize the resting state connectivity changes, we see that 
ketamine increases the connectivity within the somatomotor network which is known to be disrupted in patients at baseline. Next we see that the disruptions within the language and the visual areas is also observed across this network and ketamine again normalizes this disruption. Next in terms of ketamine modulation we see that the motor part of the cerebellum and the salience network the connectivity within these two regions decreases with serial ketamine. And finally in terms of biomarkers we see that the corticostriatal cerebral connectivity decreases only for emitters. Going back to the current literature, we saw that there was a substantial amount of missing information with respect to ketamine treatment. And taking together our results of the functional connectome, we have a slightly better understanding now of the mechanisms of ketamine treatment. We see that in terms of CBF changes, ketamine modulates CBF in the posterior cingulate and the occipital cortex after the first infusion, while repeated infusions are necessary to perturb the deep, deeper subcortical structures such as the amygdala, hippocampus and anterior insula. In terms of emotional regulation, we see that ketamine reduces the activity in the amygdala and the changes in the superior temporal cortex are associated with clinical outcome. And in terms of the cognitive control network during response inhibitory processes, we see that ketamine reduces the activity in this frontoparietal network and early changes in the occipital cortex were associated with clinical outcome. And in terms of large scale functional networks, we see that ketamine modulates within and across various large scale networks. And it's also one thing to note is that early changes in the occipital cortex predict end of treatment outcome for CBF as well as response inhibitory task. This is also seen with other ketamine studies and SSRI, NSS, NRI treatments. Finally, I want to highlight that the cerebellar to striatal to cortical loops are also implicated in other neurological disorders such as Parkinson's, OCD, Tourette and Huntington. And various fMRI studies have shown that these loops are particularly involved in emotion processing and reward based learning. And these loops that operate over a wide domain of movement, cognition and effect may be used as potential MDD biomarkers for ketamine. So to summarize the overall findings, we see that after the single infusion, the visual network is modulated, while after the serial infusion, deeper subcortical structures such as amygdala, hippocampus and the cortical cerebral loops are modulated. And in terms of biomarkers, acute changes in the visual networks are associated with end of treatment outcome, while remitters have higher functional connectivity in the cortico striatal cerebral loops that is normalized with ketamine treatment. So in future we plan to integrate these functional results with the structural connectome, compare these biomarkers across other fast-acting treatments such as ECT and total sleep deprivation and with the help of larger samples we plan to identify trait-specific biomarkers for moods such as rumination, anhedonia and anxiety. I would like to thank Catherine Nair and all the other members of Nair Lab, Shantanu and everyone else, and uh, all the personnel of the DGC and BMC and all the funding organizations. And lastly, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
should also add that this is all, all this work done in a period of less than a year. So that's uh, pretty impressive, I think. So any questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, great talk, by the way. Why would you think that um, changes in the visual areas um, would predict uh, clinical outcomes? So visual areas have uh, connections to others, somatosensory and frontoparietal, they're involved in various emotional and cognitive tasks. And other treatments like SSNRI and SSRIs also modulate this. So it's not surprising that it's a very sensitive area in terms of myelination also. So just like other treatment, ketamine is also sensitive to modulate this area. Right. Well, in your earlier slides, you mentioned a, a correlation between the dissociative effects and potentially the, the clinical outcome. So did you measure the, uh, the dissociative effects using some type of formal scale? Yes, we did use GACE and CADS uh, two hours uh, after the ketamine infusion, but there was no significant score for that. So. So it's a no correlation between the, diso the severity of the association and the, the clinical outcome? No, no. So. Yeah. Um, I might have missed this, but were the controls always a healthy control? There weren't depressed participants getting saline or something? No, they were just healthy controls, and we did have the Hamilton depression rating scale for them. So we made sure that that was less than seven. So they were, yeah, healthy. I'm sorry, I didn't... Uh... Oh, I'm just wondering, um, so if you're always comparing healthy controls with the depressed patients who had ketamine um, interventions, and you're seeing differences in the ketamine patients, and how do you know that they're coming, the effects are coming from the, how much of it is coming from the ketamine effect versus just like an aspect of the depression or something that's different than the health controls? Yeah, so that's in the future line to correlate these findings with other mood variables like rumination, anhedonia. So we want to identify trait-specific biomarkers eventually. And in this case, um, we are comparing them at baseline. So they don't have ketamine at baseline. And then we just look at those regions, how they are modulated. So, but you're right, we don't know at the moment if uh, is it due to anxiety or anhedonia or one of these measures are driving. I mean, we still don't have a much larger sample size. It's at the end of treatment, we have 51 and yeah. I have a silly question. Uh, I think in, in, some of, in several of the data, um, you showed that there was a greater response uh, um, to the first uh, dose and then with the serial administration, it wasn't, the effect wasn't quite as pronounced. I wonder if you could uh, yes, so um, that was particularly for CBF. So CBF is a, a sensitive measure for uh, pharmacotherapy drugs. So we see this early changes in CBF only after the first infusion. But in terms of fMRI, we see this more for uh, serial. So. Maybe not but yeah, that was the case for CBF. Right. Yeah. What, what do you think? So, um, since they are, um, when they receive the first infusion, that's when they are, uh, these uh, cerebral blood flow changes are most sensitive to it. And you're right, like over repeated uh, infusions, the cerebral blood flow is not modulated as much. But the bold signal, the neuronal signal, is modulated. So it's just a different measure. So they might be a, uh, the brain might be used to it by that time in terms of uh, the CBF also may be due to increases in heart rate or 
other measures which we haven't measured at the moment like but Just to sort of summarize in my own head, is it the case that everything that you saw was basically a normalization effect? Uh, so that's part one. And part two is, did you look at the uh, post-treatment to see if there were any abnormalities that persisted in spite of uh, ketamine treatment in comparison to healthy controls? So. Um in terms of post, we have the data, the five weeks follow-up data, which we haven't looked at yet. And uh, in terms of uh, CBF, we just saw after the first infusion that it was showing a normalization effect, not at the end of treatment. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah two, two quick questions. So um, when you did your analysis uh, comparing remitters and non-remitters, um, did you, did you have any folks who actually did, did not even meet response and, and make that comparison, remitters versus non-responders? And, and the second question was, um, actually, I, go ahead and answer the first one. Okay. Um, we made a comparison uh, for non-remitters and remitters here, so but it was... Look at people who didn't even meet response. Because I'm assuming non-remitters including include people who responded but did not meet criteria for remission, right? Uh, Non-remitters who didn't even respond, so they are also there in that, so. Correct, correct. So you've got people who got a little bit better but not fully better. Exactly, yeah. Um, but did you do analysis between people who didn't see any response at all versus people who got all the way better? I'm assuming you see a bigger effect. But yeah, um, I don't think we have a sample size enough now at the moment to look at that, yeah. And the second question was, any thoughts about looking um, further uh, beyond 24 hours. Just because, you know, three infusions of ketamine is quite a bit. Clinically, we see a lot of people, quote unquote, meeting for, uh, criteria for remission at 24 or maybe 48 hours. But you look at a week out and then you lose a lot of the response. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we have uh, preliminary data for five weeks post follow up. We have the MRI and the behavioral measures. Uh, it's still underway. So. So, so to answer that in terms of like what would be in terms of uh, the clinical uh, outcome, we would eventually compare the results across all the functional and structural uh, results and then perform a classifier there to separate them in terms of traits, like patients are more anxious, we have this specific multimodal analysis approach. Like which shows in terms of fiber connectivity, CBF and bold response all pointing to the same network for this specific trait. So I wouldn't say we are still there. We are still trying to uh, uh, look at the subgroups of treatment resistant depression. And, yeah. um, so was the main advantage of the independent components analysis the fact that it does your R, like it picks your ROIs for you? Does that mean? Yes, so that was really cool because um, it was a data-driven approach to have a functional atlas specific to our data. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, personality disorders and anxiety disorders are sometimes implicated in treatment-resistant depression. Did you screen for either of those, and did they have any effect? So uh, we have HDRS as the uh, score for clinical assessment. We had. Task, uh, anxiety and stress, but I don't know. We don't. We have not specifically screened them for anxiety disorder. Yeah. Back to the question about dissociation and, and the antidepressant effects. So I, I know you mentioned there wasn't an, 
Did you do your analysis to see if there was a relationship between the severity of dissociation that the, the patients felt or experienced and then um, you know, your, your SL or, or FMR. So uh, that's the thing, like when we look at the dissociative scores, especially the CAT score, we didn't have um, much of a range in terms of severity. It was a very low range, around like one to four, so we really couldn't see anything there. Not at the moment, though, sorry. Yeah. Ketamine is sometimes thought to be particularly helpful for chronic suicidality. Mm -hmm. Do you have any data on the suicidal measures in the HMD specifically? Yes. Um, we did see an improvement in suicidality score. And, uh, sorry. This is for ECT, yeah. Were there any imaging findings that specifically correlated with that, or did we test for that? Mm, we are st still working on it because suicidality is, a, I would say, more like a binary score, like you have either zero one. So we are still trying to figure that out, how it would fit in this, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Ashish for